Welcome to it, sports fans. Episode 29 from the Bleachers FTB TV podcast. What a weekend of sport. And one of the most incredible things I've ever seen in football happened this weekend. We'll get into that as our first topic today, of course. Um, but remember, you can subscribe. Podbean, iTunes, YouTube, Facebook. It is FTB. The FTB TV podcast. FTB TV podcast on Podbean and iTunes. And then, of course, on YouTube as well, from the Bleachers TV or FTB TV podcast there as well. So once again, Podbean, iTunes, YouTube, Facebook, and we are at the FTB underscore TV uh, on Instagram and indeed iTunes. You can just find it at from the Bleachers TV or FTB TV across all the platforms. So like, subscribe, all of those platforms are about to be populated really, really soon. But we're going to get into it for today. Short intro, great weekend of sport. League Cup final. There's been test cricket. There's been all sorts going on. Tottenham lost on the weekend. And we'll get into all of that. But today we're going to talk about three subjects. Of course, Surrey and Kepa, what happened in the League Cup final. And then the Proteas lost against Sri Lanka. What does that mean? I had my say last week, but we're going to get into that a little bit more. And then lastly, of course... Robert Dupria on his way overseas. A bit of panic in among South African rugby fans, which there has been for a while. I'll address that situation in some depth. But that's it. Let's get into it. FTB TV podcast. Welcome to it. Episode 29. Having great fun. Cape Town, South Africa, 26th of February. Right. We're going to get into it. Sorry. Kepa, City, of course, winning the League Cup final yesterday. Congratulations to them. Much better performance by Chelsea. Survived 120 minutes, went to penalties. But just before that, the madness descended. So listen, if you come from a traditional home like me, children are always the problem, right? No questions. If you come from a traditionally, what we may call a patriarchal home, but really authoritarian home, where children are meant to be seen and not heard. Children are always the problem. It's not a question that never gets debated, or it never did in my household anyway. Children are always the problem. So look, you know when you see a child crying at the shop and people are always going, what an awful child. All right? That's always the narrative. Like, I always wonder, like, what do you mean by that? What a spoiled brat, they say. So tell me this. You know, yesterday, uh, Keparitha Balaga seemed to refuse being substituted. But, you know, the story that everyone missed was Liverpool um, captain Jordan Henderson had a little fallout with his manager, Jurgen Klopp. And they had, and, he, and listen, Henderson was having a proper strop. He was throwing a proper temper tantrum, if you didn't see it, for being substituted, of course, in that, in that Northwest Derby, Liverpool United. Listen, Henderson walked past Klopp, who literally tried to grab his shoulder in the end. I mean... I think Henderson will excuse himself by saying he was trying to clap and look at the Liverpool fans and applaud all of them that were at the way stand. But in reality, Klopp tried to grab his shoulder to shake his hand. Anybody who saw the incident knows exactly how it went down. So he'll say, I didn't see Klopp's hand, but we saw it. Like Jordan, come on. He literally grabs your shoulder, dude. What happened was you were throwing a strop. You were emotional. You were in the game. But listen, Klopp immediately confronted Henderson, which I thought showed a tremendous, tremendous bottle, right? Like, he did, he, he did it with Sarko last season, where Sarko was late for a preseason meeting, and there was a famous Instagram video that came out, and Sarko is having a laugh, and in that, Klopp mentions that Sarko was late. If you haven't seen it, go and check it out. It's on YouTube. It is on Instagram. All right? Henderson was told off immediately for not shaking the manager's hand. It's obviously a standard that Klopp has. We don't, we don't know that uh, to be for sure. But it's obviously a standard that he has. All right? And what he did by addressing it immediately is he now, even the club captain, is 100% sure that team protocol starts and ends with the manager. What the manager says goes. He doesn't want to hear who you are. And I thought it was brilliant that it was club captain and Klopp still had a problem with something as small as shaking the manager's hand. 
I love that. The optics are fantastic, right? We can all see where the power lies there. And now you can, like, so can Henderson now. So can the club captain. He, he can clearly see it was a non-story. The manager got his way. The manager stamped his authority. Everybody saw it. So the optics are right. And also the operation side of things are right. Now we know where the buck stops. What Klopp's telling you is whether we win or lose, it stops with me. It may not be saying, he's not saying that with his words, but his actions speak louder than his words. Listen, on the contrary, Maurizio, sorry, what a horror show. What a horror show. Why is Kepa taking any flack? There's only two people that should be taking flack for this. Kepa Arisa Balaga is, he takes zero blame. Zero blame. He's a, he's a player. He takes zero blame. Like, I can't believe people are saying Kepa's unacceptable. There are two people that need 100% of the blame. One is Maurizio Sarri. The other is Josepa Aspilicueto. And my split is 90%. I blame the manager. But 10%, I blame the captain. The incident went, went on long enough that it went from the bench. And now it needed somebody on the field to take control. I mean, it took, in the end, it was a good three, four minute incident, by the way. It was three, four minutes between Surrey not being sure, storming off to the dressing room. In that moment, it needed leadership on the field. And Chelsea's cracks in the football club were exposed for the world to see. 90% Surrey, 10% as Billy Kuwaita. That is who should take responsibility. Sorry, because why did he back off his decision when it was made? Like, you've got to be saying a couple of things. You don't trust your medical team or you didn't make the call. Right? So why did he back off the call? Even worse is Surrey's losing his rag like someone forced him to keep Kepa on. What is he angry about? Dude, you made the call. The ref came and asked you whether you'd like to, to put him on. And now you're walking between the bench and the ref and it's a mess. And then you're threatening to walk off the pitch. Why is, why is Surrey angry at all? Who is he angry at? That makes absolutely no sense. It was a clown show. Listen, you can't be playing Jorginho, right? In all of this public displeasure and that is on display for everybody to see. And then you fold under what player revolt kept us waving his hand at you the authority has to be clear not just for that moment for in general where does the buck stop with Klopp it's clear with Surrey it's even clearer that he is no longer an authority if he ever was at Chelsea listen Kepa I compare him to like a boxer right anybody who watches boxing you understand that boxers will never ever bow out in the ring that's why it's taken out of their hands. The Warriors in the ring will never stop. It's taken out of their hands. You know what you have? is a guy in the corner. And the guy's in the corner. Your team throws the towel in for you. Because the Warrior never knows when he's defeated. Kepa Rita Balaga is a goalkeeper. It's a cup final. It's like five minutes to, until penalties. Why would the keeper come off? So you should take it out of the keeper's hands. The, Surrey needs to be strong. As Piliqueta need to be strong, needs to be strong, and pull the lad and stick to your call. You trust your medical team, you trust the fellow managers, and then you trust your leadership. What it showed me was there is no leadership. Egos that size cannot last over time without being managed. Egos that large cannot last over time without being managed. Aspilicueta did a horrible job of leading there. He has to take charge of that. Listen, what, what was clear about the incident is, is, is the lack of leadership at Chelsea. And, you know, that was, that was really, really exposed for the world to see. And it makes one think to say, you know, it's so great that Chelsea have this now and it's exposed like this for a couple of reasons. But I think Chelsea have been spoiled for so long that it was never a thing. Because remember, Chelsea had Lampard, Czech, Carvalho, Terry, Drogba, Ashley Cole, Ivanovic, 
Makelele over the last 15 years. I mean, listen to those names. Lampard, Czech, Carvalho, Terry, Drogba, Ashley Cole, Ivanovic, and Makelele. They're all great, great talents. Nobody's denying that. All tremendous, tremendous talents. But what else do they have? They were all leaders. The, 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 the Chelsea dressing room over the last 15 years has looked after itself. All it's needed is somebody to put the formation out and motivation. So Chelsea have replaced the talent, but talent isn't enough to win it for you. You've got to have leadership, especially with egos that size. They need to be contained. And the only way to contain it is leadership. Kepa Arita Balaga, he takes zero blame. Absolutely zero blame for what happened yesterday. Administrative decisions need to be taken out of players' hands. And what, why, why it was exposed, once again, that Sarri's not the guy, is he's, he's losing his temper when he made the call. It, it was an unbelievable show of either incompetence or a man who's lost his dressing room. Either way, Maurizio Sarri, I'm sorry, is a dead man walking. It's over. I think it's been over since November, but that's neither here nor there. It's all on the leadership. 90% on the manager, Maurizio Sarri, 10% on the captain. A bit of news, of course, from Durban this weekend. We're going to move over to a little bit of rugby. Robert Dupree has signed with the Sale Sharks through your deal at the age of 25 years old. Listen, South Africans are going crazy because Robert Dupree is leaving South African rugby. First and foremost, let me be very clear, as I am with every sportsman who leaves. Whatever your reason, best of luck out there. I've always said it. If you leave South Africa or if you leave anywhere in any country, good luck to you. I hope he makes all the money in the world. Because that's all you're leaving for. It's not the quality of rugby. Northern Hemisphere rugby is a joke. Relative to super rugby. So it's not the rugby, it's the money. Which is fine. The sportsmen, especially in rugby, in contact sports, they take all the risk. They should get all the money and get, listen, fill your boots. So naturally, the next fear is, are the twins going to leave? The best of the lot, of course, Jean-Luc, as I've said, I believe Jean-Luc is the best loose forward in South African rugby. And I don't, I don't think it's close. I don't think it's close. I love Whiteley. Whiteley for the leadership, I'd pair him with Jean-Luc and Sia. But okay, so the, the natural next fear is we will lose those two generational talents. I think that uh, that Dan is something special himself. If we can get Dan and Jean-Luc in that pack, it'll be phenomenal. But generally, this is what will happen. It'll probably follow the Ackerman model. The, the father, who is the coach of the Sharks, and the two twins won't be too far behind. Might be a family move if you know the South African landscape. Certain people are leaving. That's okay. So if they leave, say lovey. All right, that's the next fear. But secondly, I think, who cares? He's the third best fly-off in South Africa on ability anyway. He's the third best fly-off. So who cares that Dan Dupree is leaving? Like, why are people freaking out? It's like we're losing Dan Carter or what? He's never done anything. He's never taken the Sharks to a title. He's, what are we talking about? And I only care about Super Rugby. Curry Cup is no longer a relevant tournament. And South Africa, South Africa have Kerwin Bosch. Listen, Kerwin Bosch couldn't tackle a fish supper at the moment. But he's mercurial with ball in hand. And South Africa has two fly halves who can't tackle anyway. The incumbent South African fly halves, both of them are shoddy on defense. And then there's young Damien Willemsa on the way. It's infuriating that they play him at fullback. But I think it's because Rassi Rasmus will take him as the utility 10 and 15 to the World Cup later this year. Listen, Dupree understands that Springbok Rugby has chosen Pollard. So his Bok ambitions are over. They're the same age. And Pollard is probably the guy for this World Cup. And I think they'll contract him for the next World Cup. And if not, Elton Yankees, of course, is the second. 
And Alton's only 28 years old. Feels like, feels like he's been around forever. Third and finally, listen. If I'm South African rugby, if I'm Rassi Erasmus, if I'm the Sharks, I would drop Dupriya now. I'm not kidding. Drop him now. He's the coach's son, so it's not going to happen. But in reality, the Sharks owe the Dupriya family nothing. In particular, Robert Dupriya, they owe him absolutely nothing. Because I'll tell you why. He's made a business decision. He's decided what's best for him, and I congratulate him. Players should always take control of their career, particularly in contact sports. But he has decided what's best for him. The Sharks need to, number one, put South African rugby first, and then number two, put the Sharks second. Robert de Capria, it's clear, is no longer the future of South African rugby. So what you do is you swallow that money, you put him on the bench, and Kerwin Bosch is your new fly off. That's what needs to happen. You owe nothing to the Dupria family. They don't own the Sharks. They've done nothing for the Shark legacy. He's done nothing. He's 25 years old for crying out loud. He's done absolutely nothing in South African rugby. And that's not to say I don't wish him well. But if the Sharks are serious, if South African rugby is serious, Dan Dupria's career at the Sharks is over. At least as the starting fly off. Personally, I put Kerwin Bosch as my starting number 10. And if the Dupria father wants to quit, let him quit. The Sharks aren't going to win Super Rugby anyway, right? Plenty of good coaches in South Africa. Plenty of good coaches around who will take a great job. It's a great place to live in Durban. The weather's amazing. You get to live by the beach and you're lauded as a king. They still love the Sharks down there. Get rid of Dupria now. But the archaic amateur, South African rugby, I bet you he'll play. And I'll tell you my solution long term, medium to long term. Players who leave, right, they mustn't be picked for the Springboks when they leave. I hate the fact that we pick overseas players and we're held hostage by people because we're a production factory here in South Africa. And how do I know that? Northern Hemisphere rugby the international teams are filled with South African players that are nowhere near good enough for this Springbok team, which isn't very good. But also their club teams are packed with South African players who aren't good enough to be here. Right, that lets me know just how strong Southern Hemisphere rugby is. South Africa is a production factory. Talent is never going to be the problem. The talent in South Africa is the coaching. Excuse me, the shortage. It's not the talent. The athletes are supreme. South African rugby, school rugby is quite simply the most professional rugby at school level in the world. It's a production factory. From Bloemfontein, Eastern Cape, Transvaal or Gauteng as we, as we call it now, the Western Cape. We've got powerhouse schools and our players come out of high school ready to play. Phenomenal athletes in South Africa. A big part of that is the weather's great down here. So our athletes develop as children, their early development. By the time our athletes get to 18, 19, they are fully grown men. Probably underskilled in South Africa. We rely on our athleticism too much. That's why they love them up north. You don't need to be skillful to play rugby in England and Ireland. But if you're big, they'll take you. And our players are huge. Our players come stock standard 10, 15 kilograms heavier than their guys. And just as fast. Listen, SA Rugby, you are not prisoner to these players. What I say is, if they leave, if South African players leave, like Robert de Prez has left now, he'll, he's got to sign a three-year contract. When players come back to South Africa, you shouldn't be rewarded with a Springbok call-up straight away. For me, you have to play a full season of Super Rugby before you come back to the Springboks. Because it's not even, it's not even a fairness thing is we must reward the guys that stay locally. They take less money, and they live in a less safe country. That's a huge part of it, right? Let's be honest. The lifestyle in South Africa, for most people, why, why these players leave, and for certain demographics who leave, it's about the safety of their families. And I accept that. Put your family first. Put your safety first. But the players who stay must be rewarded for all the reasons you left, we must reward them for staying in a country that's 
in your mind, not so safe, as the young lad said in that French interview. If South Africa is not safe, the guys that stay, reward them for that. They're earning a tenth of the money you're earning. Reward them for that. If you leave, good luck. But if you come back, you'll play an extra season of Super Rugby before you're considered for Springbok selection. Trust me, everybody wants to be a Springbok and it changes the thinking straight away. So South African rugby, talent is not the problem. It's that you're still amateur. It's that people still think individual players change units. They don't. Good coaching, good structures, good planning wins you rugby matches. This, listen, the All Blacks have no more talent than South Africa. It's just that they've got their house in order. Everybody knows what they're doing. They're professional. SA Rugby needs to get their house in order. We've got more than enough players in this country. Wish all players who leave well. We don't need to have them here. If you want to leave, goodbye. And we'll see you later. But when you come back, I'll repeat it one last time. You must play a full season of Super Rugby so that we can reward the guys that have stayed. To the Sharks, get it together. Kerwin Bosch is there. Going to finish off with some cricket. So I just cannot believe that the Proteas have lost 2-0 at home to Sri Lanka after Sri Lanka were swept by a horrible Australian team, bereft of any confidence. Because remember, Australia just got beaten by India at home for the first time in forever. So listen. So I have to get played six series at home, including this, uh, this one against Sri Lanka. Can you really call it a series? It's a two-match test series, whatever. This one broke all the records. First, series, first test series that Sri Lanka have beaten uh, the Proteas in here in South Africa. And then it's also the first clean sweep. It's also the first clean sweep. So previously I said the South African batting has been riding the bowling attack and really on holiday for like three, four years. Right? I've been saying that. Well, for the first time in four years, South Africa's bowlers were slightly below average. They weren't awful. But for the, for the first time in three, four years, four series, they weren't great. Because usually they're great, right? First time in three, four years, they weren't great. They were slightly below average. The Proteas lost two test matches. One in under four days and the other in two and a half days. To be clear, South Africa's batsmen were facing a bowling lineup with a collection. All four of the bowlers in the Sri Lankan lineup, frontline bowlers, between all of them have 153 wickets. I'll let that sink in. Of the 153 wickets, Lakmal has 133 of those. So his companions, Fernando, Rajita, Embuladinha, they all have between them 20 test wickets. Lakmal has a test bowling average of 40. He has 133 test wickets. The other guys, between them, have 20. The other three, who are Fernando, Rajita, Embuladinha, have played 12 tests between the three of them. Twelve tests between the three of them. Fernando has played five. Rajita has played. That was his sixth game. And Embaldinha played his second. He made his debut in the first test. Listen to me. What's quite unbelievable is that the Proteas in four innings against a bowling attack. That is 153 wickets between the four of them. The Proteas in four innings didn't score on home soil above 260 runs. I'm going to let all of this sink in. The Proteas in four innings did not score above 260 runs. Listen, in the future, I'll get into who should replace them in the future, you know, but what's clear to me, and I'll say it again, I've said it before, 
Faf, Bavuma, and Amla have to go. You can't win Test cricket without a without a middle order. That's where games are, are won and lost. Forget about the top three. Four, five, and six is where Test cricket is won and lost. Amla is dead. Faf Duplessis is still living on blocking out a series in 10, 2012. And Bavuma's never quite been it. He's never quite been it. He's got one test century now in far too many games. And it's tough for me to say it. Because I like him. But he's probably a first class player trying to sort of mirage himself and masquerade as a test batsman. Bavuma's not it. Faf Duplessis is not it. And Hashim Amla hasn't been it, quite frankly, for a year and a half. It's over. They're done. The middle order is non-existent. The bowlers were let down again. You know what the beauty of it is? There's no test cricket for nine months. So SA cricket has no excuse. Usually SA cricket has all the excuses in the world. But what you can do now, because there's about a million World Cups between T20 and 50 over World Cup. But there's no cricket for about another nine months. In that time, whether they're going to go with Markram as the captain, whoever they're going to go with as the captain, just appoint him now. Do it now, before the World Cup. You, you make it clear to Faf Duplessis, whatever his contract is, you pay him out. Because he's out. He's done. Amla's done. He's been done for a year and a half. Bavuma's done. He's, he's been on the fence for a year and a half. I'll discuss who I think should replace them in the future. But for goodness sake, we need a new number three, five, six, captain. It's as simple as that. Embarrassing. 2-0 at home for the very first time against Sri Lanka. That is it from the bleachers for today. Thank you very much for joining me. Tomorrow we'll talk about more, of course, Spurs. Pochettino losing his mind. Is Harry Kane world class? We'll talk about that again. And much, much more from the sporting world that's happening out there. Plenty happening in the Premier League. Of course, Man United drawing to Liverpool. We'll discuss that as well. And much, much more throughout the week. FTB TV podcast, Podbean. If you have an Android phone, get the app on your Play Store. Otherwise, iTunes or YouTube. That's it for today. Looking forward to being with you tomorrow. Have a fantastic day day.